Hi, uh, my name is Jordan. I'm a guitarist, I guess a songwriter, and I suck at drums. But I perform and record them nonetheless, and you should too. In this video, I'm gonna try to explain why and also give you a compilation, a cornucopia even, of things that I've learned from recording drums for my current recording project. I'm gonna touch on everything from miking technique to using the Tascam for distortion to a trick I learned from Guided by Voices and much, much more. And I'm gonna embarrass myself by showing you my non-existent drum chops. <laughs> that hopefully in the end explain why they're still good enough for what I'm trying to do. Let me first give you some context to help explain what you're about to see. I'm in the middle of recording five songs at the same time. The first two tracks were an acoustic guitar that's serving sort of as a guide and spinal cord for all of the songs, and then a cajon that's simulating the sound of a bass drum. I could have also performed snare-like sounds on the cajon, but I knew I wanted something that was a little bit more like the sound of an authentic drum kit. So at some point I bought a snare and a hi-hat. Those are the tools I have, because I don't have room for a bass drum. So when it comes time to record, I usually break the drum track into parts, starting first with the cajon and then moving on to the other drum stuff. That stuff has been the focus of my recent recording. Now that approach is a compromise. I wish I could record a real drum kit, but a silver lining is that I get to break the drum part into parts, parts that are more manageable for me, a guy who sucks at drums. So my task for this series of recordings should have been simple, just to get a half-decent sound out of a snare and hi-hat and then perform only those two parts at the same time. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> I'm recording with a Tascam 424. That's a cassette multi-tracker, in this case from the mid-90s. The reality of using that device means that I'm working with a limited number of tracks, a limited amount of power over what you can do with sounds recorded to those tracks, and tape mojo, which sometimes bothers you in the form of hiss, but sometimes can help you. I set up to record these drums in a way that would limit the number of tracks that I used and try to take advantage of that tape mojo. I set up the snare and the hi-hat in the center of a small room, the shed where I do my recording. And though I could have used more gear, I decided to record the sound of both of those instruments with only one microphone. Don't worry, I've done this before, and I know from experience that one of the problems that you face is that the hi-hat can be ridiculously loud. So the first mic I reached for was a ribbon mic, thinking that I could take advantage of its figure eight pattern to exclude some of the hi-hat sound, but still get a great full capture of the snare. I tried that mic in a variety of positions and orientations, and it honestly just wasn't working, mostly because I didn't like the way it made the snare sound. This particular ribbon mic picks up a healthy amount of bottom end, and I couldn't find the right balance of proximity effect and like room ambiance when I picked distances from the snare. So I decided to instead try a simple dynamic mic. And that excluded a lot less of the hi-hat sound, but it worked a lot better for the snare. So I made a compromise to get a better snare sound, even if it meant hearing a little bit more of that hi-hat. I did other things with the microphone though to try to make the hi-hat less of a problem. I positioned it actually underneath the hi-hat and pointed toward the snare and sort of away from the cymbals. And then I decided to do most of my cymbal playing with a really flimsy blue plastic thwappy thing instead of a typical drumstick. I hope that all those factors together would give me a sort of manageable hi-hat sound with a nice full snare sound all on one mic. And it did, until I decided to start abusing the Tascam. I just couldn't help myself, you know. Everybody knows that if you take the mic signal of a snare and run it really hot into the front end of a Porta Studio-like device and then really push the tape, it distorts and compresses in the most unbelievable way. And as soon as I dialed in those settings, <laughs> Honestly, it sounds pretty fucking good. The snare sounded amazing. And honestly, so did the hi-hat, though there was suddenly a lot more hi-hat than before because of the compression. But I liked it, and I liked it so much that I even goosed the treble to get an even brighter distortion sound. It was so good. And there was an added benefit, because if you boost the treble inbound on a signal going into a cassette multi-tracker like this, you get, obviously, a lot of treble in the recorded sound. On playback, you might want to back off that treble, but when you do, you don't only get rid of the 
trebly sound that you recorded, you also reduce the volume of the tape hiss. This is a crude, but I think clever way to reduce tape hiss in a tape recording, and one that I believe the guys from Guided by Voices used. What's cool is that it doesn't just affect hiss. I at least feel like the sound of the tape compressing and distorting is a little bit different when you're pushing it with that much top end. Then I guess it was time to record, but before I did, I became concerned that I was gonna record all this beautiful top end and then lose it because maybe there was too much magnetization. Is that the right word? I'm not really sure. Maybe there was a magnetic field problem in the heads of my Porta Studio. I used to have a demagnetizer, but I lost it at some point after my kids were born. So instead of just buying a new one and using it, I thought I would try to test whether my heads needed to be demagnetized. So I copied a test that I learned from the classic Dollis Recording Channel 424 recording. I opened my computer and used the tone generator in Audacity to create a just sine wave tone at 16,000 hertz. Recorded that sound to tape. And then played it a bunch of times. And after like 20 passes of playing that really, really high pitched tone, I didn't really notice any meaningful difference in the way that it sounded. Still audible. Reading about the same thing on the meter. So it seems like nothing was really happening. And since 16K is basically the highest pitch that a Porta Studio like this one can record, I feel like that means I'm in the clear. And then it was time to record the drums for all five of my songs. And honestly, that process went pretty smoothly. I did a few things to work around my limitations as a player. And I think these things would work for you to help you record any kind of instrument that you're not that good at playing. First thing I did is, is obvious, but probably the most significant. I simplified the parts. For example, one of these songs has a very obvious shuffle feel, and I honestly have a hard time playing a shuffle consistently. <laughs> Not very good. So I dropped the shuffle part and just played it like it was a backbeat. That changes the feel, but it's something I can work with and there were a lot fewer mistakes. It's trash. And then when there were mistakes, I wasn't afraid to punch in to correct those mistakes. Punching in is something you only have to do if you're recording to tape or using some multi-tracker that's kind of simulating the experience of recording to tape. It's basically the process of activating and then deactivating the record function at specific points in the song to give you an opportunity to record something new to that track without recording over everything. It takes time and practice to get good at punching, and honestly, I'm not that good at it. But I was fortunate, in a way, to have left a bunch of spaces in these drums parts for dynamic effect because each of those spaces was a really easy opportunity to just punch in and then the next one punch out. Though that's easy, there is a downside and that is that you can typically hear the sound of the punch in. It's like a little click that's audible on the track. Well, it wouldn't be that audible if the click happened in the middle of a bunch of other sounds, but if you punch in the middle of silence, like you're definitely going to hear the click. Though the click actually isn't loud enough for you to be able to notice it if I record it with a video on my phone exactly like I do for these videos. So you just have to trust me, it's there. That's something I'm either gonna have to live with or deal with when I mix. Even though I had a strategy for performing punches, I also had to be kind of careful because I was working in analog. If I punched in to try to fix something and then made a mistake, either in the performance or the timing of the punch in, punch out, that mistake is permanent. There's no undo button. I can't get back what I have already recorded over. And now I've created like a new problem that I have to fix. And I'll be honest, there were a few times in these sessions when I did screw up. Let's see how that sounds on playback. That's ugly. And ended up having to re-record entire sections because I had blown what I thought of as a pinpoint punch. But with some patience, I persevered and did in fact finish recording the drum tracks for all five of these songs. And I'm really, really happy with the sound. It's a lot trashier than I initially imagined for this project. But I think that's gonna end up 
helping me. All these songs are kind of mid-tempo and have their roots in a folky or even kind of like country rock style. And as a result, there's a risk that they just end up kind of having a sleepy feel. And now at least I know that every time one of these cymbal crashes comes in or the snare hits, you're not gonna be able to sleep through it. It adds amazing energy and it's gonna help take these songs more in like a garage or power pop or something direction. I'm really excited to write and record like electric guitar parts that in a way respond to the sound and vibe and performances. That's one of the reasons I really like the permanence of Dawless recording. It forces you to react to these sounds and performances that you've captured. It can inspire you to think and play differently. Even though I'm a one-man band, it's like I get to have a musical conversation with each of the versions of myself that recorded these parts. And that creative communication can happen in spite of, in some ways, because of my rudimentary skills as a drummer. By the way, I'd like to drive home that I do, in fact, suck as a drummer, and I don't think that held me back because I was honest with myself and knew a few workarounds, but mostly because I wasn't afraid to record parts that a real drummer would hear and think, God, that's mediocre. And in that vein, I want to sort of end this video by sharing some thoughts that I recorded earlier today. They're meant to give my permission or encouragement to do things your way, even if your way of playing drums or keyboards or singing isn't great or perfect. You also have my permission to do what you want to do in the recordings themselves, in the performances and the sounds that you decide to capture. If you have gear, use it, regardless of whether some other person thinks it's shitty. If you have skills as a musician, display them. And even if you don't, like, don't be afraid to suck. It's okay to suck. In fact, it's even good to suck because in my experience, the alternative to doing something in a sucky way is usually not doing it at all. And that is the only choice, the only outcome that I want to discourage. If you're watching this video, it means you are interested in making something. So go on and do it. Don't stop because you're afraid that some part of it might be imperfect or even like outright bad. Bad things can still be expressive or entertaining, or powerful, or even moving. I'm at a stage in my recording project when I needed to do a shitty job. I had no choice because I wanted to record hi-hat and snare. And I am, at best, a mediocre drummer. And after I got set up to record the hi-hat and snare, there was a moment where I wondered what I was doing. What right do I have as a guitar player, maybe singer, maybe songwriter, to sit behind a kit and try to give a drum part authority? That's a critical voice, one that echoes too often in my head, and I think there's an obvious answer. I have every right. I'm a person with a creative impulse that's manifesting itself in music. That music involves drums, and I have drums, and I can play drums, even if it's not good. Those drums can help me express the thing I'm trying to express. And I don't want to be deterred by the effort it takes to find a proper drummer, convince them to help me, teach them my songs, blah, blah, blah. That's just more stuff to discourage me from actually making the music. I've been discouraged enough. Maybe you feel the same. That's why I'm giving you the same permission I give myself. Permission to do the thing, even if you haven't yet mastered it. Permission to try even if you might make a mistake. Permission to make it even if it isn't perfect. Nobody ever gave me this permission when I was a younger person. It would have been nice to have, so I'm putting it out there into the world. Let me know what you think in the comments, and as always, thank you so much for your time. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you around. Before you go, let me just show you what I have so far on one of these songs, including the results of all the drum-related stuff that I've discussed in this video. This is me reacting to what I had just recorded and honestly expressing how excited I am about the progress I'm making. Maybe some of those good vibes can spill over onto you. Okay, this time it's really bye. See ya. All right, let's play it back. Crash. Good dynamics. My God.
is good. Quiet and that symbol by playing on top of it. This sounds so good, y'all. I'm so pleased. Oh my god. I love that this is like trash can folk rock. Yeah. 